thinking or, or explaining how uh, Rural Bank thinks about the long-term prospects for dairy and indeed the long-term prospects for agriculture, because a lot of them are synergists. Um, and dealing particularly with the short-term volatility, so how do, you, how do you balance the short-term volatility you expect to see in most of the commodities, and particularly in dairy, versus the longer-term fundamentals, which are, which are pretty sound. Um, I will touch briefly on the fact that 2018 has started reasonably well. Um, we're quite comfortable where, where it's at, in line with what um, Andrew has said. It's, it's solid but not spectacular, but certainly above cost of production. Um, going then, so what, what, what happens with some short-term volatility if there is a stress, and we've all got a pretty good case study that we can refer to more recently to see how our book performed through that, and what gives you some comfort that dairy farmers and the family corporate dairy farmer, or that family-owned structure, they, do they have the resilience to go through those short-term volatilities, and then what does that therefore mean for, for the future? Um, so 2018 has started okay. The, dairy, the global dairy trade price index has increased by 12.5% across the four auctions this calendar year. Uh, so in Aussie dollars, uh, prices or the skim milk powder price uh, has increased by 5.2% this calendar year. That's probably the best trend we've seen since about May, June of 2017. So the best uh, increase we've seen for, for about nine months or so. Um, our internal analysts thought that we'd get a bit of a benefit from the dry conditions in New Zealand. They're probably those benefits have come through a bit earlier than we thought they would, so that's been pleasing. Um, and you can see that these two graphs, sort of the, the export markets for both uh, milk powder and cheese, uh, are looking uh, okay. Um, we've been able to increase volumes despite the fact that prices have been uh, falling, but we've clearly got some long-term issues around the, the stockpile in Europe, as, uh, as Andrew referred to. Um, it's been pleasing to see the resilience of Japan, uh, China and Japan, and also the increase or the re-emergence of Japan as a significant purchaser of skim milk powder from Australia, and, and that's, uh, I suppose, a good supporting uh, factor. But I, as I said, I won't speak too much about the current market conditions because I think Andrew's covered them pretty well. What we should probably talk about is what happens when things go wrong, and we've got, as, a, as I said, a, a reasonably good recent example of uh, a reasonable shock to the dairy sector. So Rural Bank, um, we've got about 8 or 9% of the Australian agricultural debt market um, and about 13 or 14% of our book is in the dairy sector. So we've obviously reasonably exposed through Victorian. So we saw conditions in the start of 2016 where you know there wasn't a whole heap of water about, um, feed prices were high, um, but the average weighted milk price is about $5.60 a kilo for milk solids, down from a forecast $6.05 um, promoted by one of the suppliers at the start of the season. Um, then on the 27th of April, the same supplier cuts their farm, guide, uh, farm gate price to a range of $4.75 to $5 a kilo milk solids, downgrades their profit forecast and introduces a, a complex loan scheme to maintain cash flow to farmers at the expense of their farm gate milk price for the next three years and, and ultimately is a retrospective change. So we saw a lot of farmers go immediately into debt. Now we saw over the next few months, it was quite fortuitous, but it, it didn't stop raining since about the start of April there. Fodder became more cheap and dairy prices started to rebound a little bit. Um, but the stress at the time in our customers at the very least from an emotional perspective was quite significant and the stories of the tears around the, the kitchen table were very real. There was a lot of uncertainty and what we did know that a lot of our customers had geared up their production cycles to take advantage of those high expect expectations of milk prices. So what we know is that you take the three major components to our customers' profitability. It's the cost of water, that's cost of fodder and then it's the, the, the prices they achieve for their product. Based on what they're expecting to see for the pro receive for their product, they then ramped up the cost base of their of their business, and then the retrospective changes caused the angst. So six months down the track, or as we sit here today, what does it look like, and how have our customers been able to cope? And the answer is they've coped really, really well. So we know that our customers have a really good ability to adjust their cost base and their infrastructure. We know that they've got, in in a whole, pretty good. Um, balance sheet structures and a lot of equity that they're able to rely upon. And they have managed through this short-term volatility in really, really good shape. I don't want to downplay the stress and the volatility and the concern that that short-term fluctuation provided, but as we sit here today, the, 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 by and large, the sector has coped pretty well. And I've got no reason to, to assume that any other agricultural lender out there has got a, an experience materially different to ours. So looking at some of the data then, if we concentrate just on our customers in the central and northeast region of Victoria, 92% um, of our customers did not change their banking arrangements with us in any way, shape or form during that period. So they didn't have to change their limits, didn't change their repayment cycles or anything uh, of the sort. About 36% of those dairy customers were in interest-only loans at the time, so they weren't looking to repay principal at the time anyway, but they continued on those interest-only payments. 
Um, about 2% were exiting the industry, but that's actually lower than the normal average rate of what we're seeing, about 4 to 4.5% um, attrition in the sector at the moment, and typically that's just the continuation of the consolidation you're seeing in the sector, so people exiting and selling to neighbours primarily. Um, and less than 4% of our customers had applied for a temporary loan limit increase over that period, so looking to get some short-term capital to, to support themselves through the period. If we look specifically at clients of Murray Goulburn, um, we had fewer of them on interest-only loans, about 30% of those customers were on interest-only loans. 90% um, or more than 90% hadn't changed their arrangements with us in any way. Um, we, uh, we know that um, around 4% were looking to downsize, so looking to adjust their balance sheets to take account the fact that they might have had uh, inflated short-term debt levels, so looking to adjust their balance sheets. Uh, two, Two customers in total, so about one quarter of 1% were looking to change industries, get out of dairying into an, an alternative agricultural pursuit. Five of our customers were actually expanding, took the opportunity to expand their operations. And again, only about 4% um, decided to exit the industry. And when we dig down into it, the majority of those have made that decision. It was a long-term plan anyway. And, it, and um, Murray Goldman's actions, if anything, were a catalyst, but they certainly weren't the cause of that action at the time. So as you sit here today, they're a pretty impressive set of figures and, and we rang every single one of our customers at that time and certainly rang um, at face to face with every single one of our Murray Goulburn customers. And um, uh, it was a great real time stress test of the book and the results were fairly um, considerable and, and pleasing as you went through it. There are some other impacts that be interesting to see from, a, from an industry perspective and consumer changes and consumer demand and also the social licence to operate and how that worked in a positive way for a lot of dairy farmers at the time. We saw Coles and Woolworths branded milk, their home brand of milk, went from about 66% of what they were selling in store down to 51% within a matter of weeks after it becoming public. Um, it's been interesting that that has almost gone exactly back to where it was now. So those, those branded products or those home branded products now account for similar levels of um, uh, at around 66% of what they are, that they're, um, they're selling in their stores. So it's been interesting to see the change in consumer behaviour, at least in a temporary perspective over that period. Um, we know, um, uh, we also assume that a lot of our customers would be changing suppliers through that period. 12% um, of our customers changed supplier uh, or have changed suppliers since uh, the issues. Um, uh, we expect that it, it wasn't as high as perhaps we thought because there are a lot of more contracts or longer term contracts in place than we had understood and in some of the smaller geographies there's probably a lack of supplier choice or practical supplier choice. Um, and then when we've seen the recovery, so people obviously drawing down more on their temporary limits, so where have they started to recover and get back to the equity levels that they had prior to Murray Goulburn or prior to the collapse of the milk price? Um, that the recovery was probably quicker in the northeast of Victoria compared to Gippsland in the southwest, um, primarily due to the lower cost of fodder in those regions, uh, and as well as, as well as being closer to some of the fodder um, uh, sources as well. Um, and while we're seeing the recovery of the balance sheets and the, the, the limits of our customers, it's probably fair to say that we haven't seen a great deal of appetite to uh, invest in CapEx over the period. So they're just getting their operational um, cash flows in order and the, the, I suppose the, the risk appetite and, and investing in material CapEx hasn't returned to that sector yet. If we look at what's driving some of this, uh, I suppose, sustainability or some of the, the um, ability of the customers to withstand these price shocks. Um, it's because we know that um, the family corporate does tend to operate in a relatively conservative balance sheet. So if you look at, on the right-hand side there, client numbers, you know, 87% of our customers by number have exposures less than $1.5 million. So even if they do get into trouble, the market is pretty effective at, at having a transparent and liquid market for them to get out of trouble if they need to, uh, and or it's a, it's a sum of money that you've got the, the, the finance providers able to support them through short-term issues. Um, and increasingly, you'll see that, that number by farmers still is overwhelmingly the, the family corporate or the family-owned farm, and obviously provides ABES figures from this conference last year showing that they were outperforming the corporate sector by almost 20% in the five years to FY16. But they also provide, from, from our organisation's perspective, a great deal of benefit from a, not only an environmental perspective, but importantly a social perspective. So the social fabric and the social capital that the family corporate provides is really important uh, from our perspective 
uh, in the business. The uh, Rural Bank publishes a, a farmland values index. So we've, um, we've gone back and we've analysed every single farmland sale across Australia and every postcode going back 20 years. It's for free. Um, get it on our website, subscribe to our Ag Answers. Um, and what it shows is the underlying security, which is the majority of the assets that most farmers are putting up a security to a bank, continues to be pretty sound as far as a, um, a, a robust source of capital, or sorry, robust source of equity. Uh, and providing that buffer in, in volatile times. Um, we've seen over that 20-year period that the average farmland increase in Australia has been 5.8% compound, and it probably hasn't been as high in some of these irrigated dairy regions. Um, we probably haven't dug enough into the reasons behind that. Clearly, um, dairy has been dealing with some structural issues in the 2000s or early 2000s over this period as well. But you're also starting with a higher value to start with, so these are the, the higher, some of the more dearer parcels of land across Australia, so in the, in the north central Victoria in the irrigation region there, that it's been about 2% growth over the 20-year period compound. In the McAllister irrigation region, about 3.2, southwest Victoria 4.4, and the west and south Gippsland at 5.3%. But you can see the values on the left-hand side there, they're, they're pretty expensive pieces of dirt to start with. What has been interesting to note, and it's not, this is not just a story of dairy, and, and these aren't dairy figures uh, specifically, by the way, they are dairy regions. We haven't looked to exclude other land uses here. But what you do see is that when prices come off, the, the supply tends to come off as well. So the family talk, corporate taking a long-term view, not only of their production, but also of their succession planning or their exit from the industry and making sure they're not selling into a depressed market. And that's been a factor, particularly in Victoria through the millennium drought. We saw the supply of farmland come right off and really protect or um, insulate those farmland values over that period. We look at the equity levels, we, we spoke about debt levels. If we look at equity levels, you know, 66% of our customers have more than 50% equity in their business. 34% um, have less than 50%, but overwhelmingly they'd be up toward in the, in the high 40s. So we've got pretty conservative balance sheets uh, out there at the moment. I suppose um, in reference, Warwick, to, to your comments on the, the Churchill study, as a, as a sector, and this is not a dairy-specific comment, but as a sector we probably need to look at the level of farm debt that's provided by four major banks, Rabobank and ourselves. So the family corporate tends to be almost entirely funded by bank debt, uh, and debt by definition has the characteristics of principal and interest repayments on a short-term basis. And that is not always the best instrument to be supporting the family farming unit through these short-term volat short volatility, and indeed not necessarily a sustained increase in, in bank debt levels into ag when we think about the investment that needs to occur in the sector as we take advantage of those global population and demographic changes. So about 98% of farmers' capital is currently coming from banks. It'll be far less in the US and, and in Canada, probably closer between 50 and 60%, depending what industry you're coming from. So the uh, alternative forms of capital, more patient capital, non-bank debt, it'll be interesting to see what we can do to encourage that into the sector and by definition, uh, reducing the cost of capital that we've got in the agricultural sector in general. Um, but that's a whole other presentation. Um, so clearly we've got some pretty good farmers out there. We think the farm gate productivity is pretty good. The production is going to increase and obviously um, we've heard about what's going to happen with the global markets and, and we probably concur that it's not going to be spectacular but we think there's going to be a fair to muddling price going in the foreseeable future. We've shown through a pretty good stress test recently that uh, our farmers have got a, the ability to withstand short-term volatility and they run relatively conservative balance sheets. Um, which brings us more then to the macroeconomic conditions and what are we seeing um, in, in the market. And I suppose, again, a bit like the milk price, uh, we expect they're going to be fairly benign, generally supportive, global economic conditions. Uh, so this is the uh, so interest rates, looking at the three-year swap rate, the 90-day bills rate, and then the, the official cash rate. The RBA met again today, uh, released at 1.30, again, no change to the, the official cash rate. So what you've seen since uh, September 16 is that those longer term three year swap rates have increased um, versus the, the short term rates. And so we are going to see some, uh, the futures market is predicting that there's going to be an increase in rates somewhere along the line. We expect that the US will have somewhere between three and five interest rates over the next 18 months to two years in line with what AB is thinking and all else being equal, that's probably going to uh, have a positive effect on the on the US dollar and, and help keep the Aussie dollar nice and low, which is obviously directly benefits the Australian dairy farmer. Um, at the same time, we've got consumer and business confidence indexes are both in positive territory, which is the first time we've had for a while. 
Um, we've had 16 consecutive months of employment growth. So things are looking fairly supportive domestically and globally uh, to support um, most industries. Um, and it's a pretty good time to borrow at the moment because interest rates are as low as they've uh, really ever been. Um, and you get asked at conferences like this to give an example. And, and, and I think the best story I've heard is that the head of the Bank of England was giving evidence at one of his parliamentary inquiries about how low global interest rates are, and, and he got asked the question. He said, well, interest rates have never been lower, categorically, full stop. And then he got back to his office and he thought, well, I'd better be able to back that up, otherwise I've just misled parliament. So you can imagine some poor analyst in the Bank of England in a corner office doing the research, and they got back to 3000 BC and they couldn't find any comparable rates. So um, anyone that says they know what's happening with interest rates simply does, is not telling the truth because we really are in, in uncharted waters and, and still a lot of the developed world is, is in negative, real negative interest rates. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens when and if interest rates increase and whether I'm still in, in banking at that time, it could be some time away. But clearly, when and if rates increase and if they increase quickly, it's going to be interesting to see how or what asset classes have been inflated and what bubbles are out there and who's going to be able to service that debt going forwards. So in summary, um, we're very bullish on Australian ag in general. Um, we think that we're well positioned. Those global demographic shifts and population trends are pretty supportive. Um, there is going to be a trend away from grain and legume based diets towards high protein based diets. We're seeing that already. Um, and obviously that positions dairy in a pretty good spot. Um, economic conditions are fairly supportive and or benign, but we need to take that long term view because uh, we know, uh, giving recent, uh, recent experience, but we know we've been in the game for a while, that you will see that short-term volatility. So as a partner in the, in the sector, we've got to make sure that we can support our farmers through that short-term volatility to take advantage of the longer-term uh, future. So thanks for the opportunity, and I look forward to answering your questions.